Jimmy Savile thing now as well, yeah? Absolutely out of the, out of the blue. For four months in 1988, so we're talking 24 years ago, I was responsible for mental illness uh, policy in the United Kingdom and um, found myself responsible for Broadmoor, which is one of the hospitals that's featured in the allegations that have been made against uh, And, and just to Savile. explain to people here, Broadmoor is it's a, it's it's a, a secure, secure psychiatric hospital. Yeah. It's where people are sent. We, we've got three in the UK. Right. Uh, there's, there's two others. And it's where people are sent when they are unfit to plead or when they have been judged to be um, such a danger to the public. But in those now, days... Now, we'd know it from the, the, the Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, was it, in Broadmoor, there. wasn't he? Oh, and there's quite a lot yeah, of them. One of the Moors murders and stuff. I presume they're not all like that in there. They're, they're, uh, there they are, are quite a lot now. Okay, right. But 20, a quarter of a century ago, it also had a wing for ordinary psychiatric patients. Okay. Uh, it had a wing for women, and, so it, and it was a much bigger place. And uh, Savile had been going in and out of there for years, since, since Harold Wilson was the Prime Minister of Britain, mm. long before my time. Um, but it now transpires that some of what he was getting up to in there, as with other places that he appeared and was, was volunteering in, yeah. you know, presenting himself as a kind of secular saint, uh, what he was up to wasn't uh, what any of us would have wanted. Like the way I've seen it described is he had the run of Broadmoor, he had his own digs in Broadmoor, yeah. his room that he stayed in, and... Yeah. Right. He, had, he had keys. He's been photographed uh, walking around with a bunch of keys at his, at his side. And that had been the case for a very, very long time. I, I didn't give him the keys. Oh. Um, what it appears that uh, I was involved in, and can't be sure until they managed to dig out all the paperwork from okay. all those years ago, um, but what we were in the process of trying to do was improve the life of patients there because it was being run like a prison. And many of them were there for a very long time without having been convicted of anything, would eventually be um, able to go back to normal life. We wanted to improve the life of the people in there. And so we asked various people, chaired by a, a senior civil servant, to give us some ideas on how they felt the life of patients could be improved. And Jimmy made an appointment to see me. And um, he said, I'm full of ideas, I'm full of lots of ideas. And then what he came up with was actually quite odd. And looking at it now, I, okay. I think I can see what he was getting up to. He'd gone through the payroll and found out that some of the prison officers were paying themselves more than they were supposed to get. He had gone through How the property... How did he have access to the payroll? That's weird, isn't it? That's a good question. Yeah, okay. We had asked him to advise us on how to improve the lives because of the patients. Okay, but it's been presented as that you put him in charge of a task force that were well, kind of running the place. That's, no. He was not in charge. Okay. Civil servant was in charge. But had you servant. appointed him to this task force? Do you know, I, uh, it's my, remem my memory of it is that he offered himself. Okay. Recommended himself. And you accept him at the time. And I suppose sure, because... everybody did. Yeah. You were, in a way, you were duped by him as well because... Everybody was. Yeah. Everybody was. But what struck me as odd when I, I found this piece in my diaries, uh, and what struck me as odd about it, reading it now, yeah. with hindsight, is that what he was doing was finding stuff that he could hold over the staff. So that okay. if anybody, I think, challenged him and said, what are you doing in those girls' rooms? He could say, don't you challenge me. I know you've been overpaying yourself. I know you've been fiddling this. I know you've been doing that. And that would mean that people would be uh, much more reluctant yeah. to, to out him, much more reluctant to take any complaint any further. And the complaints did not go any further. But, but the, the thing is, I know hindsight is a great thing and everything, but then, like, you watch that ITV documentary, there were a lot of rumours and a lot of people seemed to know and a lot of it's, it, his carry-on seemed to be in plain sight. Like, had you ever heard any rumours about him at that stage? I'd no? never heard any rumours. Right. If I'd heard any rumours, I was in a position to stop him going into Broadmoor. Yeah. We could just have stopped him. Mm -hmm. What he was doing, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't the only unofficial visitor. Princess D Diana, Diana used to go Diana was the there. other one, of course, yeah. Uh, and it was, it was Savile that got her doing this. Yeah. And he wasn't the only one. But, uh, and let, let me be clear about this. I wouldn't want to stop good people, genuinely good people, who want to befriend prisoners. Yeah. That seems to me a very honourable thing to do. Uh, and if it restricts their work in future, that's a tragedy, because there are people in there who have no friends, no family, uh, and are long-term uh, yeah. incarcerated. So that's important and useful work. Quakers do it a lot, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but what Savile was up to was something quite different. He was picking his victims 
with extreme care and real cleverness. Yeah. He was picking people, uh, kids or prisoners, who were in no position to complain. Yeah, and who were on the margins and, yeah. And, and who would not be believed, even if they did make a complaint. And then he was suborning the, the staff, the ones who should have been uh, and more responsible, perhaps should have been more watchful. Yeah. And he Do you feel terrible now about the fact that you obviously, I mean, so you say you didn't appoint him to the task force has been reported. They, like, you know, it's been reported in Telegraph. I You've think made he appointed him himself. I think he just said, I'm okay. here. Do you, can I, can you, I be helpful? Yeah, can I, I be useful? Yeah, but you, you allowed it. And you Do you feel terrible sure. about it now? I feel terrible about all of it. Yeah. What, what I really feel terrible about is that so far the police say they have more than 300 victims huh. and that he was abusing people, children and, and young adults and psychiatric patients over the best part of half a century. Did you find, you met him, uh, you met him before that I know as well, you met creepy. him in Jim Fixing. you thought he was creepy. The, the first thing you found creepy, I found creepy about him was that he was kind of ingratiating himself with anybody well known. Yeah. You don't like that. You, you feel he's telling you the stories that he thinks you want to hear. Yeah. And if you cease to be uh, important or significant, you're never going to see him again. Okay. You know, the, the, uh, the contacts, the friendships will dry up. Um, he took me to uh, a very posh club in London called the Athenaeum. He was proposed membership there by Cardinal Hume. Mm. You know, no, no more saintly man than that really yeah. did, did ever exist. A really good man. Um, but what he didn't realize was that women couldn't be full members. So we were not allowed to be in the main dining room. We were relegated to the basement. That is not going to impress somebody like me. But yeah. he didn't realize that. Okay. Uh, but all the time he's feeding you the stories he thinks you want to hear. Yeah. And yet at the same time he's revealing stuff about himself. Uncomfortable stuff. So you were uncomfortable? About him. I never liked him. Right. I never but liked you, him. But you obviously didn't think I could. But just because I wasn't comfortable with somebody, I couldn't start accusing him of stuff. This without is it. And he was a secular saint, yeah. as you say. This Listen, yeah. uh, let's talk about the diaries because that's, that's kind of what you're here to talk about. You, you, the second volume of your yeah. diaries, and they're really good. What struck me about them is that um, they're, they're very, very personal, a lot of it. There's a bit of political stuff there, and it's basically it's John Major's government. but. There's a lot of personal stuff because these are your real diaries and you kind of do say at times in it that you're writing the diary in a lot of ways because you had no one else to talk to it's, about these things. It's, a, it's a, a strange experience writing a diary. By the time we get to that volume, which starts 20 years ago, I've been keeping a diary for about five years. And I'd started off wanting to write about what I could see in the political world. Mm -hmm. Uh, to have a ringside seat to people like Margaret Thatcher was um, awesome. And I really wanted to be able to share that and uh, really to write my view of what was going on. Because, uh, you know, history is written by the winners. Mm. And sometimes there are other people around who've got a slightly different perspective. So I wanted to do that. But after a while, you start to write how you feel about something. And then next thing you know, you've had a bad day, there's been a row. You're writing your side of the story. Mm. And it becomes a friend, a friend who doesn't criticize, a friend who doesn't tell you you're wrong, a friend who listens. And, of course, it's a false friend. Yeah. Real friendship is one in which people say, Edwina, you know, perhaps you're not right about this, but your diary never says that. Okay, so it's, it indulges you. Mm. But, but in a sense as well, it was that I suppose the person you would have confided in otherwise would have been Ray, your husband. Mm. But, like, it's very sad in the book because you're not fighting and there's no fireworks, mm. but slowly you're, you're just, just living entirely apart. separate lives and you we don't were, talk. We were actually married for 28 years altogether. Yeah. And th there'll be some in the audience or some listening who will know exactly what I mean, that you, 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 you're not fighting each other. You don't actually disagree. You actually enjoy each other's company. But the essential element, the support, the warmth, the love is, is, has quietly disappeared. Um, and certainly by the time I was writing novels and doing well, yeah. and I knew that I could survive, that financially I could be independent, that even if the political world um, disappeared, yeah. that I, could, I, I would be okay for the first time in my life. That was when it was okay for you to leave then? Then you start to think seriously 
right, do I want to carry on with this, which is not making me happy, or, you know, I'm a woman in my 40s. Is there another life out there? And we should, we should point out as well, though, in fairness to, to Ray, that as you revealed in the first volume of the diaries, you had had a four-year pretty full-on relationship mm. with, with John Major mm. during the course of the marriage. So I suppose that probably didn't help matters either, did it? <laughs> no, I'm not being smart, like, but... If you, if you're married and you fall in love with, with somebody else, that yeah, help. I guess it means you're not you as present it, in the marriage. You put it very well indeed. You're not. Yes, you're not as focused as you should be. Yeah. Of course. Um, I have a feeling we talked about that last time I was on. Um, yes, that's Sorry right. Sorry for bringing it up again. That's but it is right. interesting. <laughs> but there's also there's, there's a good lesson to come out of this as well, which is you know, so many years on, I've remarried. I've been married now for mm -hmm. um, eleven years. Ray has remarried very happily. Perhaps we were right to do that. Perhaps we were right to split up. Yeah. Even though no, neither of us wanted to. We both like being married. But now we like being married to somebody else. And that's worked out very well. So you just have be, the message to the women of Ireland out there who believe me, you say, th I think they know what I'm talking about. There are so many silent marriages out there. The message to them is be brave for a little while and you, you, there's happiness oh, no, at the, the other end. Anyway. The message is find the right man first, if you can. And to the men, be the right man. You look okay. after your women. All right, listen, Adrian, it's fantastic talking to you there. And uh, there's the book. It's the second volume of Edwina Curry's Diaries, and it really is a great read. Ladies and gentlemen, Edwina Curry.